Good evening. President Nixon reportedly will announce his resignation tonight. Vice President Ford will become the nation's 38th president tomorrow. That word comes unofficially from aides and associates of... The president has been part of politics for 28 years now, part of the national political scene for about 24 of those years, and this appears to be the final day of his administration. Tonight at 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, the President of the United States will address the nation concerning developments today and over the last few days. This has, of course, been a difficult time. This is indeed an historic day, the only time a president uh, has ever resigned from office in our nearly 200 years of history. You see the White House there, and in just a few moments now, President Nixon will be appearing before the people, perhaps for the last time as President of the United States. Have you got an extra camera in case the lights go out? Two minutes to 15 seconds to air, please. Yeah, I know. This was much worse than we thought. Nixon was worse than we thought. What happened was worse than we thought. He violated the law. He compromised the office. And he left a deep and wide black mark in American presidential history. No, there will be no picture. Just take it right now. This is right after the broadcast. You got it? Come on. OK. That's enough. My friend Ollie, oh, he's about to take a lot of pictures of me. <laughs> I'm afraid he'll catch me picking my nose. <laughs> can't believe that that guy was president of the United States because he is just branded in our national memory as a crook. And I think it's really important to understand the wrong approach to executive power that led Nixon to those crimes. Oh, you're on a level, don't you? Yes, yes. Good evening. This is the 37th time I have spoken to you from this office where so many decisions have been made that shape the history of our nation. Need any more? There was good in him. Uh, he had been a, a, a good vice president, but he, he was a fatally flawed man and a fatally flawed president. Richard Nixon, a guy who had been a hero to millions of Americans. Here's a guy who received more votes than anybody else in the history of this country. but. The Richard Nixon that they supported through the years was not the Richard Nixon that they thought they knew. To think that we're the only generation that had that experience is probably the mistake that a lot of generations make. He is ready before the cameras it's now. President Richard Milhouse Nixon, 37th President of the United States. Throughout the long and difficult period of Watergate, I have felt it was my duty to persevere. Watergate doesn't go away because it was so extraordinary. It was so hidden. We act like it can't happen again. And they did a lot of stuff after it. There was a lot of hoo hide and passing laws and giving speeches. But if you ask me, do I think we learned anything from it? No. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. A president had been driven from office because the American people had learned the truth about Richard Nixon. But how he had learned the truth, that fascinated me. Nixon's downfall had begun two years earlier when five men were caught spying and wiretapping at the Democratic National Headquarters at an office complex called Watergate. Over at the Washington Post, two rookie reporters, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, picked up the story. Their investigation would unfold like a political thriller. And so I thought that the part that they played in exposing the scandal would make a movie, maybe even a good movie. In Hollywood terms, Woodward and Bernstein were the good guys. Woodward! And their weapon was the written word. Did he confirm it? Absolutely. Get it to Bradley. I played Bob Woodward in the film. Carl Bernstein was played by Dustin Hoffman. 
one of the things I had observed with Carl is that he smoked so incessantly, and Carl was always, always had ashes on his tie and his shirt, and I said, that's got to be in a movie. Is there any place you don't smoke? Forty years later, the two investigative reporters are back in the Washington Post newsroom. I joined them for a reunion with Ben Bradley, I'm glad to see you. their former editor. Like a, like a working reporter. <laughs> it's the first time in decades we've all been together. Hello, Robert. How are you? It's tempting to think that Watergate could never happen again, but these two reporters and their editor know better. Come on, I look, I look pretty damn good. Good, yes. considering. It's only 40 years ago. Is it? I wanted to dig deeper into their story and to see what, if any, impact it had on our culture today. Okay, so Carl, you won't be there. Let, me get, let me get these guys out of their misery. Vanity Fair photographer Annie Leibowitz is here to document the three men who took on our president. For Bob Woodward, Watergate started much the same way most stories do, with a phone call from his editor. The moment the time I got the call, about 9 a.m. on Saturday morning, June 17th. That's good. No one flashed a message to me, this is going to be one of the most important days of your life. I was in the office that day, and uh, I saw all this commotion around the city desk on this Saturday morning. Went to find out what it was. And there was this moment in history that became known as Watergate. Woodward and Bernstein, for those of us who were in the profession, I think we were quickly in awe of what they were doing. I became truly inspired by both their incredible investigative reporting and their storytelling. I remember thinking when I first read the Woodward and Bernstein articles, where is this going? Especially coming in the midst of all the turmoil that was playing out in the streets around the country. <laughs> President Nixon's first term in office had been marred by loud, frequent, and sometimes violent protests, largely against the Vietnam War. It really did seem like the world was unraveling. Growing up in a suburban existence with parents who saw Chicago in 1968 erupt into flames, saw people burning their draft cards, saw a sexual revolution, saw a drug revolution, saw, saw Woodstock coming to their homes. Well, when I joined the Nixon White House, there were a lot of demonstrations against the war. It probably was some of the most intense times I think our country had ever faced. I mean, often we were feeling like we were in a state of siege. You felt it physically. And we knew that we were going to have to protect the White House. There was a lot of discussion about using troops directly facing the demonstrators, which I felt could lead to direct confrontations and conflicts. And so it came to me, why don't we do what John Wayne did? Let's just circle the White House with buses, not wagons, but with buses, which is what we did. And so, did you want to be on the side of Jane Fonda or John Wayne? My parents chose John Wayne, and therefore they were for Nixon, and Nixon was on the side of law and order. Nixon now, Nixon now. Nixon's law and order platform was very popular. In the coming election, he seemed to shoe in for a second term. I again proudly accept your nomination for President of the United States. By the summer of 1972, Nixon's campaign machine was in full force. But amidst the hoopla, his re-election committee would suddenly become entangled with a mysterious illegal break-in. 
Five men were arrested early Saturday while trying to install eavesdropping equipment at the Democratic National Committee. Well, it was the Sunday after the burglary. We were the only two who showed up in the office. I was in the office that day. I was writing a profile, and I, I said, this is a better story than the one I'm working on, and uh, I think I'd like to work on this. And it turns out that one of the men has an office in the headquarters of the committee for the re-election of the president. James McCord, the lead burglar, had been in the CIA and the security business for decades and now was the head of security at the Nixon campaign. And we thought, wait a minute, what's going on here? Woodward and Bernstein never imagined that answering that question would lead them smack into the Oval Office. On August 1st, 1972, I picked up Woodward and Bernstein's third article on Watergate. It said that one of the Watergate burglars had gotten money from the Nixon campaign. What the reporters would soon discover was that Nixon's re-election committee was engaging in a campaign of espionage and sabotage against the Democrats. Woodward and Bernstein were beginning to pull back the curtains on a strange and shadowy world. And I wanted to know how they were doing it. I got really intrigued with the idea of making a film about Woodward and Bernstein because one was a Jew, the other was a wasp, one was a radical liberal, and the other was a Republican. And what interested me was, beyond that, was really the hard work that they did together to get at this story. So I gave Woodward a call. And he was pretty chilly on the phone. I said, hi, this is Bob Redford calling. He said, yeah. and. I said, I, I wanted to know if I could meet you and your partner because I have this idea I want to share with you. Woodward came to me and said that Redford had called and I put together who Redford was and who was interested in talking to us or whatever. I, I, I said, we're busy, we got to do this story. For Woodward and Bernstein, it wasn't only that the break-in seemed fishy, there was something just as odd about the White House response. Presidential press secretary Ron Ziegler called it a third-rate burglary attempt. Ron Ziegler calling it a third-rate burglary, that was the tip-off to us. There seemed to be nothing third-rate about it except they got caught. They had raised the stakes so high with this third-rate burglary nonsense, and it was apparent that something here was really rotten. Nixon assigned his top lieutenants, the president's men, the task of managing the fallout from the break-in. Among them, Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman and presidential advisor John Ehrlichman would become the guardians of the clandestine activities. Watergate begins to monopolize more and more of their time. We know that because Nixon had a secret tape recording system in the Oval Office. Haldeman and Ehrlichman knew what they had to do, cover all the tracks leading to the White House. They started by enlisting another of the president's men, legal advisor John Dean, would monitor day-to-day -day changes. After the Watergate break-in, I really very quickly become the desk officer at the White House on Watergate. I'm the person who others below me report, and then I in turn report up to Haldeman and Ehrlichman. So they're, they're deeply involved. It is a classic criminal conspiracy. As Woodward and Bernstein had suspected, the first clue to that conspiracy would be found at the Republican Committee to re-elect the president. The treasurer was Hugh Sloan. We'd raised $60 million, which was the most successful fundraising to that point in history of any presidential campaign. But some of the committee's practices were starting to make Sloan uneasy. Hugh Sloan, he was right out of Republican central casting. 
clean cut, seemed to always have a shirt and tie on, but he was troubled because he was the one who was giving out the money. I was fine with everything up to the point uh, I was directed to give cash to specific individuals. Sloan would soon learn that some of the campaign money raised by the re-election committee had found its way into the hands of the Watergate burglars. The key was the money and finding these people who controlled these funds and figuring out what they did with the money. By now, Woodward and Bernstein weren't the only ones following the money. The FBI was on the trail, and more importantly, a grand jury had begun its own investigation. And everyone wanted to talk to Hugh Sloan. The cash that financed the Watergate break-in, five men had control of the fund. Bernstein and Woodward showed up, and they uh, first recommended that the right thing to do was tell them the whole story so they can print it. We're not asking you to be our source. All we're asking you to do is to confirm. I'm not your source on Haldeman. I mean, they were very engaging people. A little bit the good guy, bad guy, cop kind of routine. What do you, or, say, say we wrote a story that said that Haldeman was the fifth name to control the fund. Right. Would we be in any trouble? Would we be wrong? And they had established through conversations and other means that I would have acknowledged basically five people as having the authority to tell me to dispense funds. And uh, one of them was Bob Haldeman. Let me put it this way. I would have no problems if you wrote a story like that. If you wouldn't? No. Well, that's it. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. If you are looking for a phrase that defined what the execution of Watergate was, it was a Haldeman operation. It was driven by Nixon, but operationally, it was Haldeman doing it. On October 25th, two weeks before the election, the Post front page headline pointed the finger at the number one man in the president's inner circle, Bob Haldeman. Woodward and Bernstein reported that, under questioning by the grand jury, Sloan had testified that Haldeman controlled the campaign's secret fund. It was a journalistic coup, but they were wrong. They'd never been asked a question about Bob Haldeman. Sloan, in fact, had not named Haldeman in his testimony. The White House pounced. I don't respect the type of journalism, the shabby journalism that is being practiced by the Washington Post. And I use the term shoddy journalism, shabby journalism, and I've used the term character assassination. This was their opportunity to discredit the Post, Woodward, and Bernstein, and bury the story. They came after us, Ziegler, the press secretary. So we knew that at that point the stakes were very high and we were the targets. All I know is that the story that ran this morning is incorrect. We made a mistake. We had an intellectual understanding of the facts of the story and Haldeman's role in Watergate. But what was in the Washington Post was untrue. We should not have allowed that to happen. I was angry at myself and, and Carl and how we got it wrong. And we thought maybe we are going to have to resign, maybe we should resign. I mean, we were kind of at the end of, of our rope. But Woodward and Bernstein, the path to the truth, had just gotten longer and harder. But now with 496 electoral votes to his credit on the verge of a landslide win. We can see the dimensions of Mr. Nixon's landslide tonight. According to our CBS News estimate, President Nixon has been re-elected. And let's go now to the Republican headquarters at the Shoreham Hotel in Washington. I've never known a national election when I would be able to go to bed earlier than tonight. And please repeat after me. I. Richard Nixon do solemnly swear. I, Richard Nixon, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Looking back at the early Watergate reports, it's hard to believe that Nixon was completely unscathed. To the best of my ability, and will to the best of my ability. Imagine a president getting away with that unfolding scandal in today's political environment. Serve and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. 
So help me God. Woodward and Bernstein went back to their desks, put their heads down, and continued to grind away at the story. I knew that I was going to be judged, the paper was going to be judged on this story. And therefore, uh, you know, I think you could get away with not being 100% accurate on day one, but you had to be as close as you could get, and you had to be closer the next day and the closer the day after that. They knew that Haldeman was controlling the campaign secret fund. The question was, who was controlling Haldeman? I was amazed by Woodward and Bernstein's resolve. There's nothing glamorous about what they were doing, but I thought it was important to portray the tedium, the hard work, and the feelings about the film from a studio standpoint was non-commercial. Newspapers, typewriters, phones, mm -mm. Washington, uh-uh. And Bob did something which was brilliant. He said, these guys, even though they're from separate, you know, diverse backgrounds, think of them as one, particularly when they're interviewing people. He said, let's learn not only our own lines, but let's memorize the other guy's lines. What's this here? What are you reading about Sloan? Sloan. Sloan was the treasurer of the committee to realize. His realize. wife did what? His wife is pregnant, and she made Sloan quit because apparently he no longer wanted to be a part of it. We've got to go see Sloan. Okay, make a note of it. So what do we got? Where is that, where is that match? Each of us would come in at any time. We would take one half of a sentence, he'd finish it. How do we know that? Because she said it. Right here. She said at the time of the break-in, there was so much money floating around that I know that Jordan got part of it. So I said, you need I to thought it was one of the most exciting and most successful things that we did in that film. Like Woodward and Bernstein, Dustin and I couldn't have been more opposite. Mr. Redford. Boy, it's been too long. One of the things that you, I remember you telling me was that you had trouble, even you at that time, had trouble getting a studio to say yes because oh, yeah. the, they all said, we know the ending, so why should we do right. all the presidents? They said, why would we do this when we know what the outcome is? I said, well, this, that's not what the story's about. It's about the two guys. That's right. And what they did that nobody knew about. And, and you the, said it was a detective story. Detective story, yes. that, and, and, but the main thing, I mean, and, and I think you felt the same way was the the alchemy of the two guys considering their differences and one of the tough story points for me was how to deal with Nixon how do you betray someone so twisted on the inside and so straight laced on the outside Richard Nixon is now the guy who when you see photos of him even at his prime you cannot believe he was ever president of the United States. He seemed to me to be the kid in the schoolyard whom all the other kids picked on, and I identified with that. Who was Nixon? Uh, Nixon. Nixon was a party guy, an animal. You know, to me, Nixon was a caricature, unfortunately. And I, man, I had my Nixon down. You know, 10 years old, walking around the house, you know, he just I am not a crook. Now, I have a much more complex view of the man and his presidency. President Nixon created a brand new federal department, the Environmental Protection Agency. The question of who is Richard Nixon is almost uh, imponderable. I, uh, I looked at him as one of, really one of the great minds that has ever really been in the presidency. He, he had achieved some extraordinary breakthroughs. I mean, his opening to China, detente with the Soviet Union. The sad truth is, I think Nixon would, by today's standards, be considered maybe a conservative Democrat, maybe, at, at some levels, a radical leftist. Hello. Here's one of the men around the president we don't hear much about, Alex Butterfield, deputy assistant, who handles much of the paperwork. My first meeting with the president, oh my God, I, I can't tell it without acting. And today, Butterfield and the president... Nixon came out from behind his desk and looked very tentative. He had no idea what to do, so he began to gesture. Okay. Fine. No words came out, no discernible words. It's just this deep guttural, uh, 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 uh. this is the president, I couldn't believe it. Alexander Butterfield would play a crucial role in the Watergate investigation. 
He had direct knowledge of the secret taping system in the Oval Office. Haldeman came to me. He said, the president wants a tape recording system. The Secret Service has a technical security division, electronics guys and communications guys. So that's who I went to. The, the first thing, he indicated, he intimated that they had done this before. He didn't say, yeah, we did it for Johnson. Yes, we did it for this president or that. But, and he also indicated these things usually don't work out very well. Well, just say you get it. Uh, are we going to go after some of these Democrats or not? Uh, please get me the names of the Jews. He was a paranoid man. He was sure that people were out to get him. I'm sure some people were out to get him. But he, he gave up a lot to get him with. He wasn't glamorous, he wasn't social. He's kind of awkward and very smart, but it's hard to get past the tapes and what you hear on the tapes and the rambling and the paranoia and the, just the insanity. We're up against an enemy, a conspiracy, they're using any means. We are going to use any means, is that clear? I really didn't know Richard Nixon when I went into the White House. I had a public image of him. And as he gets more comfortable with me, I start to see a rather dark side of this man. And I, I realized very quickly he's a man who harbored tremendous animosity towards his enemies, literally. He doesn't forgive, he doesn't forget, and he wants to get even. The real Nixon is on those tapes. It is a roadmap of his mind. It is a roadmap of his presidency. For Woodward and Bernstein, the roadmap would lead to an eerie underground parking garage and their next big break. There, Woodward met with a highly placed government official who had a deep understanding of what was going on in the White House. He would become known as Deep Throat. Just follow the money. Deep Throat would become the most memorable figure in the Watergate scandal. When Woodward Bernstein's book, All the President's Men, came out, guessing Deep Throat's identity turned into a cottage industry. I have to do this my way. You tell me what you know, and I'll confirm. I'll keep you in the right direction if I can, but that's all. Just follow the money. Deep Throat was a blessing that I didn't want to mess with. My day was simply known as the Double Cross. In our present context, it means infiltration of the Democrats. I just felt it was a wonderful piece of drama. I want to talk about Watergate. I know we're not going to talk about that subject. Sometimes he just was not very forthcoming, and a couple of key times he was. It's clear from the book, and and I hope from the movie that it's somebody who was conscience-stricken, somebody who crossed lines that somebody in that sort of responsible position rarely crosses and crossed for the best of reasons. He gave us a solidity in what others were telling us that might have sounded unbelievable, given how crazy some of it was. I didn't know what Deep Throat even looked like. I didn't even know if it was a man or a woman or a dog. The term deep throat, everything was on deep background, meaning you could use it, but not with any kind of attribution at all that would indicate where it came from. I wouldn't quote you even as an anonymous source. I mean, you'd be on deep background. The fascination with that one source, I think was driven in part by the anonymity, right? That we, we knew, um, what happened in the administration, we knew um, through all the president's men how Woodward and Bernstein ferreted out the story. We knew all these other things, and the one thing we didn't know was the identity of this one source. I, I tend to think that no deep throat, no movie. I just think there is something so incredibly bondish about it that without that, I'm not sure you get the Hollywoodization of the story. Because he, to me, was probably a crucial element in you know, follow the money. Deep Throat was Woodward's contact, and it took him a while to let Bernstein in on the secret. 
He says, I am somebody who works at the Justice Department who's in a very advantageous position. He told me a bit about him, didn't tell me exactly uh, who he was or where he worked. He didn't want to talk on the phone because he knew about what was going on with wiretaps and how they would go after journalists. So he said, we have to meet. It struck me at the time as kind of odd, but again, I was just beginning this process of Washington reporting. It sounded reasonable to me. Let's meet at 2 a.m. in this underground garage. In this garage, under the cover of night, Deep Throat began to allude to a far-reaching conspiracy deep in the heart of the White House. It involves the entire U.S. intelligence community, FBI, CIA, justice. It's incredible. Deep Throat was a great help in that he confirmed information that we had obtained elsewhere for the most part, and it gave us a better idea of how big the conspiracy was. Deep Throat was out there, and we began to hear about it from the ground up that Bob had this special source. When will the rest of the world know who is Deep Throat? But when that source <laughs> passes away or releases us uh, from our agreement in Pledge of Confidentiality. All right, the inevitable question, who is Deep Throat? We've said Deep Throat is a man. You can rule out some suspects, like Diane Sawyer, a former Nixon press aide, now network anchor. Woodward says Deep Throat was a man. You build a, a uh, fairly strong case for the identity of Alexander Hay. Do you have any idea who Deep Throat was? Deep Throat is, in my opinion, a collection of people. People ask, how did the secret of Deep Throat last for so long? And the answer is, neither of us told our ex-wives. <laughs> so during our filming, Woodward casually mentioned that the actor Hal Holbrook's portrayal of Deep Throat was pretty close to the real thing. So when I asked him who the man was, he just smiled. Other guesses over the years, Nixon campaign aide John Sears and FBI official Mark Felt. I never leaked any information. Uh, I didn't give anybody any documents, and I'm getting pretty fed up with the whole thing. Mark Felt certainly caught some people's attention. He was the number two man in the FBI, and he looked the part. No, no, I'm, I'm not deep throat, and uh, the only thing I can say is that I wouldn't be ashamed to be. Three decades later, Bob Woodward went to visit Mark Felt. The elderly man was living with his daughter on a quiet street in the suburb of San Francisco, coincidentally named Redford Place. Well, I was talking to a friend of mine, and for some reason we started talking about Watergate, and he asked me about my father, and I started telling him about the, all the reporters calling, and I said, you know, as a matter of fact, one reporter, uh, I think he said his name was Bob Woodward from the, the Washington Post, came to the house to, uh, to try and get an interview with Dad and try and find out if Dad is deep throat. And my friend said, Joan, Bob Woodward knows who deep throat is. And that's when I started thinking, oh my gosh, maybe Dad could be deep throat. But Dad denied it. He said that he wasn't Deep Throat. And I said, Dad, you've got to tell me the truth. Please tell me the truth. I need to know. Tell me. And so he did. He looked me in the eyes and said, all right, if that's the way it's going to be. He said, all right, uh, I am. I was that person. I got a call from Vanity Fair, where I'm a contributing editor and told that in the next few hours they were going to break a story saying that Felt was deep throat, and would I confirm it? Carl came down to Washington, and we talked about this. Should we reveal it? Should we confirm it? What's the obligation now? And then Ben Bradley stepped in and said, it's out, it's over, you need to confirm it, and so we did. Felt was the number two man at the FBI when he says he became the source who helped reveal Watergate, the scandal that brought down President Richard Nixon. My dad, I know him, I know him so well, and he's a great man. He's so kind, he's so attentive to other people and, and loving, and we're all so proud of him, not only for his role in history, but for that, for the character that he is, the person that he is. Clearly, there was an element of the conflicted man, the divided man. But then when I saw him on the doorstep, the video of Mark Felt and uh, his 
pajamas and Walker with a smile on his face, the smile of likes that I, I had never seen him smile. He was not a happy person in all the years I dealt with him. Turns out to have been liberating for us, for the truth, for felt, because now, you know, there was an awful lot of speculation in those 30 years, uh, including by many of our peers and colleagues, that we made this up. This was an element of clarity and closure, answering a question that had persisted for a long time. Deep Throat begins to guide Woodward and Bernstein through an elaborate maze of covert activities. Gradually, the reporters begin to connect Watergate to many more of the president's men. By the beginning of 1973, Congress could no longer ignore the scandal. Their investigation would boil down to one simple question. What did the president know, and when did he know it? The Senate tonight voted 77 to nothing to establish a select committee to investigate the Watergate bugging case. The committee will be headed by North Carolina... Barely eight months after Woodward and Bernstein published their first article, the Senate created a select committee to investigate the Watergate scandal. The story had started with a couple of young reporters nosing around a suspicious break-in. It had now grown into a full-fledged examination of the Nixon White House. I know we're obstructing justice. I've told Haldeman that, I've told Ehrlichman that. They didn't want to hear it. At one point, Ehrlichman made a wonderful classic remark I couldn't forget. He said, John, there's something putrid in your drinking water out there in Old Town where you live. And I said, no, John. I said, I'm just a realist. We got problems. On March 21st, John Dean walked into the Oval Office to give Nixon a blunt assessment of the damage Watergate was doing to his presidency. He had had his feet on the desk. And as he often did, he was kind of looking around his shoes at me. I have, I have the impression that you don't know everything I know. And it makes it very difficult for you to make judgments that, uh, that only you can make. And after that remark, uh, his feet were swall solidly on the f floor. He had slid his chair up and I had his full attention. I knew at that point he knew something, but I didn't know how much. There's no doubt about the seriousness of the problem we've got. I'm warning him. He's got problems. This was not good news I was about to share, that there was a cancer on his presidency. We have a cancer within, close to the presidency, that's growing. It's growing daily. He kind of just absorbs that for a minute and thinks about it. And as the conversation goes on, and I, and I say, you know, Mr. President, I don't know where this will end. Uh, it's just going to keep going up. The Senate investigation was closing in on the president. To distance himself from the cover-up, Nixon needed scapegoats. In one of the most difficult decisions of my presidency, I accepted the resignations of two of my closest associates in the White House, Bob Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, two of the finest public servants it has been my privilege to know. When, when he gets rid of Haldeman and Ehrlichman. He's also planning his defense. The Watergate scandal broke wide open today. The two closest men to the president, H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman, have resigned. And he thinks this will protect him. And he will claim that he had known nothing about a cover-up until I told him on March 21st. So he's sorting all this out until the end of the month when he decides he's just got to let everybody go. And then, of course, he fires me. On May 17th, the Senate held its first public hearing. One by one, the president's men were summoned to the Senate chamber. Under cross-examination, each was asked, had the president of the United States broken the law? What did the president know, and when did he know it? I don't think there's ever been a moment in American nonfiction television history that is as riveting as the Watergate hearings were. I did not grow up with the memory of having seen it, obviously, but it was this omnipresent thing in the way that my mom talked about my childhood. Because she was a young mother, home with a baby on the hip, and what she did for my infancy was feed me and watch Watergate. 
I was sitting in a dressing room making the film The Great Gatsby. And to keep yourself from going mad, you'd watch the hearings. And that was fine because the hearings were so interesting, you couldn't yeah. stop. And what was interesting was the drama and the tension and, and the, the, the certain area of mystery. What's going to happen? Do I understand that you are testifying that the, the committed to re-elect the president and those associated with them constitute... The Watergate hearings were an absolute unifying television experience for the entire country. This is a special report from... I can remember watching it and thinking, man, they're interrupting soap operas? Wow. You just figured that this must be something enormously fundamental to our democracy. Most of us thought the most dramatic testimony would come from Haldeman and Ehrlichman. But in the end, it would be John Dean who transfixed the country. Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and the president knew we did have an option. We could, at that point, drag the wagons around of a giant lie that would protect everybody who was willing to lie. Who was willing to lie? Haldeman, Ehrlichman. Point is, I didn't run around trying to bribe anybody. I didn't run around trying to shred documents. I didn't, as a matter of fact, we preserved the documents. The president, Ehrlichman, and I made no attempt to take over the Watergate case. The view of all three of us through the whole period was that the truth must be told, and quickly although we did not know what the truth was. So, when I testified... Counsel will call the first Thank witness. You. Mr. John W. Dean III. I knew clearly, was I in or out, was the question. And I decided I could not play that game. I've made mistakes, we've gotten ourselves in a deep problem, and further lying and living that lie, even if I can get away with it, isn't something I'm comfortable with. You swear that the evidence that you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do, so help me God. I see. Like most Americans, I too was riveted by John Dean's testimony. But I ask, your name is John W. Dean III. That is correct. I remember being struck by how methodically he presented Nixon's pattern of deception. When the president called me, and we had a rather rambling discussion, I told him at the conclusion of the conversation that evening, that I wanted to talk with him as soon as possible about the Watergate matter because I did not think he fully realized all the facts and the implications of those facts for the people at the White House as well as himself. You had the president's counsel. People forget he was the president's lawyer. You, <laughs> you, can't, you can't have anything worse happen to you than your own lawyer turning against you. <laughs> I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency and if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. I also told him that it was important that this cancer be removed immediately because it was growing more deadly every day. John Dean's testimony was on for four days. It was mesmerizing. People were missing airplanes. People were standing around furniture stores that sold TV sets, watching in the plate glass windows the television. I told him that cash that had been at the White House had been funneled back to the re-election committee for the purpose of paying the seven individuals to remain silent. And Dean wasn't pulling any punches. He had been a recipient of wiretap information, and then Haldeman had also received some information through Strawn. And I said to myself, wow, everything John Dean is saying to that committee, I hope they know it. It is true. The council was retained at that time. What uh, date was that? That was on the 25th, as I recall. We absolutely believed what he was saying, and the more evidence we got, the more it confirmed what he was saying. Meeting of March 21st. As I have indicated, my purpose in requesting this meeting, particularly with the president, was that I felt it necessary that I give him a full report of all the facts that I knew and explain to him what I believed to be the implications of those facts. We had White House logs of meetings. So when he said, I met with the president on March 21st, we could look at the log and see, well, he certainly did. How do you expect us to resolve the truth in this matter when you state one story and you've testified here and made yourself subject to cross-examination and the president 
states another story, and he does not appear before this committee. Can well, you give us any information as to how we might resolve this? Mr. Chairman, I, I think this. I strongly believe that the truth always emerges. I don't know if it'll be during these hearings. I don't know if it'll be through the processes of history, but the truth will out someday. It's very hard to think about the president not being believed and John Dean being believed. So if it came down to he said, he said, the president was gonna win. President Nixon and his counsel, John Dean, now appear to be at odds over the Watergate scandal. One Nixon aide knew how to prove who was lying, but no one had asked him. While in the barber shop, I'm watching the, the hearings, as was everyone, every place. This is the morning of Monday, the 16th of July. I was really quite relaxed until I got that phone call. We're gonna want you to come up here and testify. The senator wants you to testify at two o'clock. So I said, well, you can just tell him I'm not coming. So on the tube, I see this guy go in behind the senators and whisper in Irvin's ear. And his, those big bushy eyebrows of his went whoop, you just, you could see him going up and down. And he, he, he wasn't pleased, you could tell that. And he tells this young man something and the guy leaves. Predictably, right away, the phone rings. And he said, I just told the senator what you said. And he said, if you're not in his office at one o'clock, he will have federal marshals pick you up on the street. That's exactly what he said. Carl Stern is outside the Senate caucus room, and maybe he can tell us more about Mr. Butterfield and what he is expected to tell this committee. Carl? Well, there was a lot of speculation. I, I, obviously, something was, was cooking as far as what he was going to say, because uh, we were deviating from, the, from the, the schedule. We believe his testimony will have to do with White House procedures. And those that room was chock full of people. Boyfriends with girls standing on their shoulders, People in the window ledges up there, cameras all over the place. I'd like to uh, change the usual routine of questioning and ask minority counsel uh, to begin the questioning, Mr. Butterfield. Thank you, Mr. Dash. The old caucus room was packed full of famous names and celebrities and whatnot, you know, kind of a circus atmosphere, frankly. Mr. Butterfield, I understand you previously were employed by the White House. Is that correct? That's correct. During what period of time were you employed by the White House? I would like to preface my remarks, if I may, Mr. Thompson. With I'm sorry, I believe you do have a... If, go right ahead. Uh, although I do not have a statement as such, I would simply <clears throat> like to remind the committee membership that whereas I appear voluntarily this afternoon, I appear with only some three hours' notice I want to know, I was enjoying a haircut just at 11 o'clock today. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I tried to think, is, is that direct? Yeah, that's direct. That's a very direct question. I, I'm not trying to sound dramatic here, but I knew then that the jig was up. I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. I was under the assumption that this tape recording system was still deep, dark secret over at the White House. That secret was well kept. When you stop and think, Rosemary Woods, his secretary, never knew about the tapes. Henry Kissinger, as close as Henry was, never knew about the tapes. John Ehrlichman never knew about the tapes. Two people told me about it before it became public. I called Bradley at home at 9 o'clock on a Saturday night, I believe, and said, Nixon taped himself. It's all, oh, what should we do? And Ben said, oh, I wouldn't bust one on it, and it's kind of a B-plus story. And I thought, okay, the boss says B-plus. I won't work on it. I took Sunday off, and Monday they called Butterfield. And I remember Ben came by and knocked on my desk and said, okay, it's better than a B-plus. From that point on, of course, it's a fight for the tapes because they answer the questions. Am I telling the truth? Is the president telling the truth? And what else happened, you know? Uh, the prosecutors immediately subpoena the tapes. The Senate subpoenas them. So Nixon is early advised to destroy the tapes.
The discovery of the Nixon tapes would ignite a new battleground in the Watergate drama. And it was something like this. Nixon's attorney general had appointed a special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, to investigate Watergate. The special prosecutor then demanded that Nixon hand over eight of the tapes. Eight specific tapes of conversations, uh, either in the president's office or on his telephone. Nixon not only refused, but on a Saturday night in October 1973, he also ordered his attorney general to fire the special prosecutor. The attorney general was appalled. He said no and resigned. Then the president told one of his assistants to call the deputy attorney general. When I picked the phone up, it was Al Haig. Said he wanted me to fire Cox. I said, I'm not going to do it. Ruckel's house refused in a moment of constitutional drama to obey a presidential order to fire the special Watergate prosecutor. First, the attorney general, to his great credit, just saying, I'm not going to do that and, and resign. And then the next person, who is the deputy attorney general, Bill Ruckel's house, one of the great people in the Nixon administration, one of the most ethical men I've ever known, he too was not willing to do it. So, the deputy attorney general, Ruckel's house, also resigned. Well, you'll have, there'll be an announcement out of the White House uh, later on. I can't say a thing. There will be? Does it have to do with the resignation of the attorney general? Well, it might, but you'll have to get it from them. Al Haig, he said, well, your commander in chief is ordering you to do this. And, you know, I don't know what that added to the discussion, but he said, well, who else is around? And I said, well, Bob Bork is here. He was the number three guy in the department. And Bork was the last one that was really eligible to do it. The commander in chief finally found someone willing to carry out his orders. Bork fired Cox. And I have asked all the personnel in the department to stay and help keep the department going in this extraordinarily difficult time. And so ended what would become known as the Saturday Night Massacre. One White House source said the president's motive was solely to remove the possibility of a constitutional confrontation as quickly and as thoroughly as possible. Richard Nixon violated the law, he compromised the office, and he violated the compact that we thought we had with him. Before he did all this, he must have considered the probable reaction in Congress, including the possibility of impeachment. There were some of us who felt that the imperial presidency was getting out of hand. The Saturday Night Massacre was a signal to the American people that a president was putting himself above the rule of law, and they demanded action. And the public outcry to the Saturday Night Massacre was so significant. Just the insanity of the Saturday Night Massacre, like, who, who does that? How could you think you could get away with that? It's just not, it's not stable. People in high office tend to want to arrogate power to themselves, and they tend to want to keep it. Power still tends to corrupt. Presidents, by the nature of the job, are just unlikely to ever shed any of the executive power that their predecessors have accrued to the office. Every president since Jimmy Carter has expanded the powers of the presidency. And when President Obama ran for office, he had, as part of his pitch as a candidate, what was wrong with the expanded executive power that was asserted by the George W. Bush administration, especially on national security issues, things like torture and rendition and secret prisons and all that stuff after 9-11. But he hasn't given any of that power back now that he is president. Tonight, I would like to give my answer to those who have suggested that I resign. I have no intention whatever of walking away from the job I was elected to do. After four months of legal squabbling, the presidential tape recordings were finally delivered today to Chief Judge John Sirica. You won't hear them, however, until all the discrepancies have been accounted for, and today that situation grew worse, not better. Much worse. Nixon had handed over the tapes, but there was a catch. I was in the White House, things were fairly quiet, and I got a call to go to Ron Ziegler's office. We go up to Ron's office thinking it's something routine, and Ziegler is clearing his throat a lot and is kind of rattling his coffee cup. And that's when we learned about the gap in the tapes. We had been told just about three days earlier that the worst is behind us, and suddenly there was an 18 and a half minute gap in the tapes and all hell broke loose again. The conversation in question took place just three days after the Watergate burglars were caught and the Watergate prosecutor thought it was important. 
We know that the 18 and a half minute gap was a conversation about Watergate because it was with Haldeman and the president and Haldeman was a meticulous note taker and he took notes. The president's personal secretary, Rosemary Woods, was recalled to explain how she accidentally erased 18 minutes of an H.R. Haldeman conversation with the president three days after the Watergate break-in. It didn't happen by accident, would have been our first suspicion. I was the lawyer who questioned Rosemary Woods about the 18 and a half minute gap. Are you discussing testimony tomorrow or an actual mother reenactment bringing in her death? I don't want to comment on that. Rosemary Woods represents really the majority of women at that time. You could be a nurse, you could be a teacher, you could be a secretary, or you could be a housewife. Those were your choices. I was a very early professional, and there we were, head to head combat, basically. Miss Woods said it was a mistake. A record button hit accidentally while she took a phone call. She described that she had pushed the wrong button. Instead of pushing stop, she had pushed record. She also had to keep her foot on the pedal. Miss Woods used the machine to show how it happened. So when I asked her to demonstrate, she pushed the button, kept her foot on, and she supposedly reached back about six feet to get the telephone. Her foot came off the pedal just with the mere movement, and there was just no way it was believable. The White House contention that the talk between the president and Haldeman, Haldeman was accidentally erased will give more ammunition to the president's critics. To hear something that was so obviously untrue. It changed a lot of the American public's view of the whole situation. Rosemary Woods would stand by her story. Bob Woodward would later write, the 18 and a half minute gap became a symbol for Nixon's entire Watergate problem. The truth had been deleted. The truth was missing. Watergate was becoming a bloody mess. Nixon was a wounded president. All the President's Men was a very violent movie. It was violent in a different sense. You didn't see anybody shot or blown up or poisoned, but people were out to kill each other. Get out your notebook. There's more. And the weapons were telephones, typewriters, and pens. Your lives are in danger. So as a result, we would accentuate the volume in all those instruments. I love the scene when Redford, playing the part of Bob Woodward, sees Carl reworking his story. How's it going? What are you doing? Polishing. Do what? Polishing. What's wrong with it? Nothing, nothing. It's good. Then what are you doing with it? I'm just helping. It's a little fuzzy. May I have it? I don't think you're saying what you mean. I know exactly what I mean. Not here. I can't tell from this whether Hunt works for Colson or Colson works for Hunt. May I have it? Please? Some of your conclusions. May I have it? Yes, I'm not looking for a fight. I'm not looking for a fight either. I'm just aware of the fact that you've only been here nine months. And now, having known both of them, that was so true. And that's what goes on in newsrooms. If you're going to do it, do it right. Here are my notes. If you're going to hype it, hype it with the facts. I don't mind what you did. I mind the way you did it. The thing about Bernstein that I think you captured so well was his assuredness about how right he was, you know. <laughs> At the same time, totally intuitive, totally instinctive, where he had to push Woodward. And you're rewriting me, because right, right. you're a better writer, and you do it without even <laughs> thinking how bruised it's going to be. Woodward was, if the right word is, I don't know, didactic, he would go A, B, C, D yeah. in his investigative work, and Bernstein would go A, B, H. We had the luxury of a fat, dynamic institution, the Washington Post. It was right at its peak. There's always been some chicanery in American politics. You're always going to have some underhanded dealings. Nothing comparable to this. It ended up that Woodward and Bernstein ushered in a new era of, of journalism that opened up the White House in a way that would have made LBJ and JFK and FDR very uncomfortable. Marcus, everyone asks the question, could the Post do a story like Watergate or do Watergate now? But what's your... You know, 
In today's world, that story would catch fire much faster. The minute the break-in occurred, you know, you would tweet it. Both sides would seize on it. It was an, it's an election campaign. It would be, you know, they would be using it immediately as fodder for their, both sides in, in the battle. Everybody would chase it. I mean, there would be bloggers. And as a result, it would be much harder to do what you did, probably, because there would be such, they would clamp down much faster. It's a great question, how Watergate might unfold uh, in the current news environment. You could look at the sort of glass half full argument and say, my goodness, with all these people on Twitter and, and all these reporters, you know, in the 24-hour news cycle, that if a big story began to emerge, uh, it would never be two lonely guys pursuing it forever because, you know, the entire pack of the cyber universe would, you know, bay like wolves after the White House until it happened. They used to say a reporter was only good as his phone numbers. We can hunt and stalk sources so many different ways. The toolbox that I have available to me as a reporter, digital voice recording, email, social media. We can truth tell them in real time. When they say something, we can be Googling what they're saying, playing back to them. We have access to all known thought, one click away. Ability to surround and ferret out source in a way that Woodward and Bernstein only dreamed of. The internet is a tool just like a typewriter is a tool, telephone is a tool. At the end of the day, journalism requires incredibly dogged persistence on the part of journalists who are seeking the truth. We, well, over here, so. we worked over here. I'm here, you're, you're here, there. and I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was the did. noise of typewriters, yeah, and right. it was the smoke of people who smoked. People smoking. 38 years ago. Jesus. Why do things have to change? That's, that's right. Right. Every day, Bob and I would go have a cup of coffee together in the morning in a little vending machine room off the newsroom. It sure is quiet in here. <laughs> and on this particular day, not that long after the break-in, I put a dime in the coffee machine, which is what it cost then, and I literally felt this chill go down my neck. I mean, literally. It made my hair stick up, I think. And uh, I turned to Woodward and I said, oh my God, this president is going to be impeached. And Woodward looked at me and he said, oh my God, you're right. I would like to add a personal word with regard to an issue that has been of great concern to all Americans over the past year. I refer, of course, to the investigations of the so-called Watergate affair. I believe the time has come to bring that investigation and the other investigations of this matter to an end. One year of Watergate is enough. But as hard as Nixon tried, Watergate would not go away. The meeting will come to order. Resolve that the committee on the judiciary is authorized and directed to investigate fully and completely whether sufficient grounds exist to impeach Richard M. Nixon, President of the United States of America. It took the American people to force Congress into action. This was not like what happened with President Clinton where a special prosecutor said you should do an impeachment. There were those of us in Congress who wanted to take action, but the powers that be refused. It was only when the American people broke down that wall of resistance and said, you've got to do what you can do under the Constitution to reign in the imperial president. The American people were losing patience. And the Congressional Committee was furious. They knew they had only scratched the surface. There were thousands of hours of recordings, but Nixon, was refusing to release any of them. President Nixon today defied subpoenas demanding that he produce tapes and papers in his possession, and the country moved closer to a clash between the White House and the Congress and the courts, which will be unprecedented in American history. It became clear he wasn't going to produce them voluntarily. But there's a reason why he's drawing the line. He's taking all this flag. There must be some damaging things on there. I was concerned, we were concerned that uh, 
that he might dispose of the tapes. I mean, that in and of itself uh, could be a criminal offense, burning of the tapes, destroying the tapes. Nixon never thought the tapes that he was making secretly would ever surface publicly. They would always be for his private use. It was never designed that they would come out, so there's a kind of spontaneity and free flow of people talking about their authentic conclusions, and uh, it's, it's horrifying. President, you've made it perfectly clear you don't intend to release those tapes. Perfectly but clear. Perfectly clear. <laughs> it would be up to the Supreme Court to make the decision. On July 24th, 1974, the court issued its ruling. Good morning. The Supreme Court has just ruled on the tapes controversy, and here's Carl Stern, who has that ruling. It is a unanimous decision, Doug, 8 to 0. Justice Rehnquist took no part in the decision uh, ordering the President of the United States to turn over the tapes. The court voted unanimously, unanimously, to require the, the tapes to be released. Some of those members of the court had been appointed by Richard Nixon himself. So you had the court system acting in a nonpartisan way, in a credible way, uh, regardless of politics. Imagine that in the politicized Supreme Court that we've had uh, in, in, in our recent history. While Nixon tried to put on the pretend act that operations were going on as normal, they weren't. They were disintegrating every day. Three days after the Supreme Court ruling, the House of Representatives took the step most dreaded by the president, impeachment. Nixon's fate now rested in the hands of the committee. Today, I am an inquisitor. And hyperbole would not be fictional and would not overstate the solemnness that I feel right now. My faith in the Constitution is whole, it is complete, it is total. And I am not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution. Mr. Hungate. Aye. Mr. Conyers. Aye. Some Republicans who voted for the impeachment. Mr. Albert. Some Democrats Aye. who voted for impeachment. They were putting their Mr. Aye. political lives on the line. And all of us were putting our reputations on the line. Ms. Holtzman. We voted on the impeachment. It was one of the most sober and solemn moments in my life, and I think in the life of everybody on that committee. Everybody understood the stakes for the country. That's what this was all about. And it was above party. It was what was good for America and what our democracy required. Mr. Railsback. It was the Republicans that ultimately provided uh, a real measure of putting country ahead of party. Nixon held his ground. He insisted he knew nothing of the cover-up. But among the thousands of hours of tapes, one conversation recorded shortly after the break-in would destroy what was left of his credibility and his presidency. What finally catches him is when the tapes are released, uh, the smoking gun tape puts the lie to the statement that he had no advanced knowledge. On the tape, you hear Nixon telling Haldeman to direct the CIA to stop an FBI investigation. Without going into details, don't, don't lie to the defense, don't bother. But you say, this is sort of a comedy of errors, and that they should call the FBI, and so they don't go any further into this case, period. Those words clearly led to an obstruction of justice. And I was always amazed at the president's nonchalance. He didn't seem to care. I wanted to say to him, my God, man, do you know what you just said? Do you know those tapes are rolling? After the smoking gun tape came out, the president lost all support, Republican as well as Democrat. Republicans went to him and said, you have to resign. We cannot support you anymore. It was Republicans, finally, who 
made sure that Nixon had to leave office. Barry Goldwater marching down to the White House. So uh, we sat there in the Oval Room, and the president acted like he just played golf and just had a hole in one. You'd never think this guy's tail was in a crack. Nixon said, how many votes if I'm impeached in the House, how many votes in the Senate? About 20. And Goldwater said, very few and not mine. The 37th president of the United States was facing the ultimate disgrace. For a man who craved power, the question was, would Nixon continue to fight? I don't, I don't remember exactly where I was or what I was doing the night Nixon resigned, but I remember the feeling, relief. Okay. Hey, you're better looking than I am. Why don't you stay here? <laughs> Blondes, they say, photograph better than brunettes. We are standing by now for President Richard Milhouse, Nixon, 37th President of the United States. Have you got an extra camera in case the lights go out? Where, who'd you get it from? from is that an NBC? Let me see, did you get these lights properly? Uh, yes, like, my eyes always have, you will find if you get past 60, that's enough. In just a moment now, the President of the United States will begin uh, his speech, perhaps his last speech from the White House. Good evening. We watched him sitting on the floor eating bologna sandwiches and having a sense of unreality, quite frankly. From the discussions I have had with congressional and other leaders, I have concluded that because of the Watergate matter, I might not have the support of the Congress that I would consider necessary to back the very difficult decisions and carry out the duties of this office in the way the interests of the nation will require. I was just awestruck at the whole thing. No gloating, very little sense of self it was really about the magnificence of what had occurred in terms of the right thing. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. Our first reaction really was, okay, he's not president anymore. He's just a citizen. Now we can indict him. Honestly, that is what we thought. Earlier today, the East Room of the White House was the scene of an emotional meeting between the president, his cabinet, and the aides who have stayed with him during all of these years of Mr. Nixon's tenure in the White House. You have this president who is bitterly resentful of what had happened to him in his political career, overlaid with a Shakespearean level of paranoia. And he was willing to engage in extraordinary acts to preserve his power. All presidents are human beings. I assume they will have faults and flaws. I assume they will make mistakes. I assume that once they're caught in their mistakes, because of who they are and the kind of people they are, they will try to cover up those mistakes. I was in the East Room of the White House when he made that very bittersweet, very poignant, maudlin speech with his family gathered around him. I look around here and I see so many in this staff that, you know, I should have been by your offices and shaking hands and I'd love to have talked to you and found out uh, how to run the world. <laughs> Everybody wants to tell the president what to do. And uh, boy, he needs to be told many times, but I just haven't had the time. He's not looking into the camera. He's kind of stirring off and going into the stream of consciousness about his mother, who was a saint. I guess all of you would say this about your mother. My mother was a saint. And that's the most honest speech I've ever heard any politician give. And I'm standing there, much, much thinner, younger version of myself, uh, crying. We think that when we lose an election, we think that when we suffer a defeat, 
that all has ended. It's really sad. Really sad. And I, I don't think any president has been more wrongly persecuted than Nixon ever. I just I think he was a saint. Always remember, others may hate you. Those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. Ultimately, what comes through on the tapes and what comes through in Nixon's actions is his hate, uh, his vengeful hate. And in that last farewell, he gives that self-revealing line that hate will destroy you that this piston of hate, this all-encompassing desire to get the opposition, to wiretap, to spy, to destroy, to sabotage, the ugliness of warfare was brought to American politics by Richard Nixon, and the day he resigned, he kind of seemed to get it, seemed to say, yeah, I destroyed myself. There were no tanks in the street. There were no armed men around the White House. We had this exceptionally peaceful transition of power at a very traumatic time in our lives. The presidency was secured by the decency of Gerald Ford, and by the extraordinary strength of the constitutional law that defines what the presidency is. There was this relief that somehow uh, the system had worked. And then there were, in the aftermath, a lot of reforms that were put in place. The media changed. Uh, investigative journalism had been an incidental situation pre-Watergate, post-Watergate, it is the, uh, it almost becomes a standard. Presidents before Watergate had been, really by most reporters, been given a presumption of innocence. In the aftermath, they're almost presumed guilty. It really dramatically changes the relationship of the news media with the president system had worked, including the role of the press, but really the idea that the system had worked in this amazing way that a criminal president had been forced to leave office, that the principle that nobody in this country is above the law, including the president of the United States. For Nixon and the nation, one question remained unanswered. Would the president now be hauled into court? After Nixon left office, we learned that the Watergate break-in, that third-rate burglary, was not an anomaly, that Nixon administration was involved in a whole range of questionable activities. Breaking and entering, wiretapping, destruction of government documents, forgery of State Department documents and letters, secret slush funds, plans to audit tax returns for political retaliation, conspiracy to obstruct justice, all of this by the Law and Order Administration of Richard Nixon. It sounds bad when you put it like that, huh? In the end, some 40 people pled guilty to Watergate-related crimes. John Ehrlichman, Bob Haldeman, John Dean, and 16 others went to jail. You know, to this day, I'm not quite sure when I enter the conspiracy to obstruct justice. That's one of the things I'm actually trying to figure out. When did I cross the line? When did I enter that illegal conspiracy? No question, I went across it. There was a real major breakdown in personal integrity, as well as organizational integrity, on the part of us that were given those assignments. I'm not quite sure exactly where I'm going to be for the next few months, but uh, that's, uh, I'm gonna miss you all. It also requires you to ask the ethical questions. Is this, is this right? Um, is it respectful? Is it responsible? Is it fair? We didn't ask any of those questions. I and mean, we should have started with, is it legal? We were so caught up in trying to serve the president's 
needs or desires that we did not ask those questions. I, Gerald R. Ford, do grant a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon for all offenses against the United States, which he... President Ford's pardon of Richard Nixon stunned the nation. Or may have Nixon's legal problems were now over. Well, when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. By definition. Exactly. The former president was still not accepting responsibility. Three years after resigning, Nixon was paid to participate in an historic interview with the British television journalist David Frost. At the very end, the inevitable question came up. Do you feel that you ever obstructed justice or were part of a conspiracy to obstruct justice? He would not, he wouldn't really admit anything, not even mistakes or whatever. He was really stonewalling completely. And he was beginning to look like the haunted Nixon of the actual Watergate hearings rather than the Californian ex-president. And so finally I said to him, but won't you go further than the word mistake? What word would you express? And that was a real gobstopping, gobsmacking moment. My goodness, that's a... I threw aside my clipboard and, and I said, well, I think there are three things you've got to say. The first is that, uh, that in fact, that you did go to the very verge of criminality. And secondly, that you let down your oath of office. And thirdly, I put the American people through two years of needless agony and I apologize for that. And I know how difficult it is for anyone, and most of all you, but I think that people need to hear it, and I think unless you say it, you're going to be haunted for the rest of your life. You're wanting me to say that I am participated in an illegal cover-up? No. The key to Nixon really is his dislocated relationship with truth. If true, greatest words ever written in journalism. What is the truth? What is the truth? What really happened? You guys are probably pretty tired, right? Well, you should be. Go on home. Get a nice hot bath. Rest up 15 minutes. Then get back in gear. We're under a lot of pressure, you know, and you put us there. Nothing's writing on this except the uh, First Amendment of the Constitution, freedom of the press, and maybe the future of the country. Not that any of that matters. Arguably, maybe the best movie on reporting made. What I didn't expect was the echo of the movie to last that long. To this day, yes. I keep hearing about it. One thing about Watergate, it was going to change the culture of Washington. It did no such thing. You, you know, if, of course, this kind of thing is going to happen again. And, and it's going to happen in a much, much bigger scale. Whether you talk about FDR or whether you talk about Nixon or whether you talk about Kennedy or whether you talk about Clinton, we have presidents that seem to be in politics for the right reason, but presidents that also have a, a fatal flaw. Richard Nixon's fatal flaw brought him down. People in high office tend to not want to lay themselves open to their enemies and acknowledge embarrassing things or mistakes that they have made, and uh, they tend to want to lie when they feel like they can get away with it. All those things have been around long before Watergate and still are around. It was an age-old story of an abuse of power and forgetting that you're accountable to the people that put you there. And There'll be more, and we'll survive. What pulses through the Nixon story is the question, why? When he was elected, the goodwill of the nation and the world, it was his. That's the sadness of the Nixon presidency of uh, what could have been. Woodward and Bernstein are among the most famous journalists of our age. Their names will always be associated with the downfall of a president. Forty years later, it's a moment to, to ask what the greatest political scandal in modern history means to us. 
It's an evolutionary tale, and we've evolved, uh, and we're older. Bob and I brought very different baggage to the story, and it meshed. So this was when you were 29, 30 years old. You'll never see a story this good again. Well, who knows? Who knows? You know, <laughs> who knows? It's a tale to maybe inspire a whole new generation. Maybe. A generation who are now learning about Watergate for the very first time. Thank you.